Hello, party people. How's it going? It's 4.30, the day's almost over, you made it, everyone's still awake, and I'm gonna try to keep you awake for a little longer. Uh, my name is Lauren White, I'm a design researcher on the Xbox research team at Microsoft. I've been working on the console platform for a little over five years now, and uh, it's just really great to be here. Um, back presenting again, I'm kind of pausing and reflecting career-wise on my journey here. It's just great to be here and be able to share some of the things that I've learned and some of the things that I've been working on. Um, there's obviously another name up there, Devesh. He is sadly uh, not on the stage with me, but I wanted to include him. He's the data scientist that I've been working on. He's in the data intelligence and gaming uh, team at Xbox, and uh, this presentation and all this work would absolutely not be possible without him, so I just wanted to thank him. Um, I also would not be up here if it weren't for this gentleman. This is Daniel Reesberg. He's a professor of psychology at Reed College. And uh, I remember when I was a wee little freshman, I was in an intro to psychology course. And after the cognition section that he was teaching, um, I basically knew what I was going to major in. And fast forward several years later and several uh, letters behind my name later, um, I am basically up here doing, doing the do. Um, the other big point about him is this idea of him being a psychology professor, and then he was also doing this other thing while I was there as an undergrad, um, working with the legal system, and doing a lot of work with law enforcement in Oregon, serving as an expert witness, um, and doing all that kind of good stuff uh, legal-wise. So I bring that up because he was doing these, you know, these two big things in his life, um, and propagating these two big ideas. Um, does anyone know what this symbol is called? Just toss it out if you know. Ying-yang, okay, thank you, a ying-yang, thank you. Um, what does it symbolize? Anyone? Balance? Yay, you guys know the answers. It's like you read my notes. Um, yeah, so this is ying-yang. It's basically this idea of like symbolizing bar uh, balance and harmony, um, sometimes between these two things that may seem like they're opposites of each other or may even be in like conf uh, conflict of each other. Um, so these two words, hopefully, if you are here, you have a sense of what these two words, when they're put together, mean, user research. Um, there are some user researchers that do surveys. There are others that do sentiment analysis and look at positive and negative and neutral feedback. Um, there are others that do like focus groups and field interviews and that kind of stuff. Um, then there are other researchers that just straight up do usability and make sure that the products and services that you work on um, can be actually be used and users can use them in the way that they were designed to be used. So hopefully that's like sounding fairly familiar. Um, there should be like nodding, like mental nodding right now. Um, and then uh, data science. So are there any data scientists in the room? Kind of one? Okay, so like two. I'll do this like half as like you guys ent essentially enter like one and a half. So there's one and a half data scientists in the room, fantastic. Um, so as I understand data science, this is you know, this big push of like big data and algorithms and all this awesome stuff that's going on with big fancy computers and big machines. Um, but the way that I really understand it is you know, looking at this large data set and trying to understand past behavior in order to predict what will happen in the future with some kind of confidence. That's kind of what I boil down data science to be. So then, what happens when you put these two beautiful things um, together? What kind of magic comes out of this? Um, so I'm you know, fortunate to be at a company like Microsoft where you know, we've been kind of tasked to intermingle these two disciplines a little bit more formally um, and get all kinds of the good stuff from both of us, um, both sides of our teams, to make some really good stuff happen and learn some really interesting things. And I'm also fortunate enough to be at a large company where we have people that uh, specialize in each one of these disciplines and that people are not like a user researcher, kind of a data scientist. There's a user researcher and a data scientist. So this is my weird, just come with me on this metaphorical journey with me. This is how I envision Xbox. Um, if Xbox were Earth, um, there are user researchers and there are data scientists and there are marketing people and there are PMs and engineers. There are all these people that are working on this thing called Xbox. Um, they're doing like their own specific little things. They're monitoring this kind of data over here. They're interested in learning about this thing over here. But really, like when you zoom out, we're all just looking and we're all interested in understanding Xbox and our Xbox users. So at this point, you know, I was really interested in 
you know, partnering with Devesh and getting to this idea of how can we bring this user research knowledge that we have with this data science um, side of things. So, you know, we were basically interested in learning this answer to this very specific question that we had. And if you kind of want to like nerd out a little bit more on this metaphor with me, we were kind of starting to maintain like the same orbital patterns. Um, even though I was using like my own separate set of devices and telemetry on my satellite and Devesh had his own separate set of things that he was gathering on his side, but we were still kind of following the exact same path. If you are not as utterly familiar with this screen as I am, this is the Xbox One home screen as it currently stands right now. Um, if you were to turn on an Xbox One, this is essentially what you would see. There would be some variation with content. Um, but I, as a platform user researcher, can tell you a lot about what users think about this thing um, that we call Xbox Home. I can tell you about the interaction patterns and the things that they like and the things that they dislike and the content that's there and all kinds of other things. But the real question that Devesh and I were really interested in learning the answer to is this idea of how could we improve this experience? How could we change the Xbox homepage and make the content more tailored, make the experience seem like it's more intelligent, um, essentially surface, make sure that we're surfacing the right content to keep our users engaged longer and make sure that we're creating like the best experience possible, essentially. So this is just, I know the text is very small there, it's not meant to be read. Um, this is just one way of how we kind of visualize um, this information that's coming in from the data, side, data science side of things. So, you know, there's a lot of um, information coming in metric-wise as click-through rates and impressions and title history and duration and all these other crazy things that we're tracking um, as far as, you know, measuring usage on our platform. So getting into the kind of case study part of this. Um, so there were two users here. So the user on the left was last playing the game Surviving Mars, and the user on the right was last playing the game Tacoma. And they are you know, players that are using the same kinds of apps in the same games. Um, and we're just kind of curious, like how, how will this new piece of content that we're planning on showing on the Xbox homepage, how well is it going to do with these users? Are we going to be able to um, showcase content that is engaging and interesting and meaningful to them to improve their home experience. So this is just one way that we kind of abstracted this um, from the data science side of things with these specific two users. So we're able to look at their respective click-through rates and their durations and their title histories and all this other stuff um, to basically get a better sense of who they are from like a metric perspective and get to the point of us saying, okay, well, we know all this stuff about these two users and then when we actually look at the data science side of things, we can say, oh, well, these two users, act, they're actually very similar to each other. Um, they're essentially identical when we're looking at them from the data science side of things. They exhibit a lot of the same behaviors, a lot of the same patterns, and a lot of the same, um, duration, or the, uh, a lot of the same history um, as far as what they do on our platform. So let's say that we are interested in showing this one specific piece of content on the home page. Um, so we know that the users have played a lot of LEGO games in the past. Both users have played a lot of LEGO games in the past. So we're thinking, oh, well, if we show this LEGO thing on the home page, they should, in theory, both be interested in it based on their past behaviors, data science side things, and creating all these predictive models to learn, OK, well, the chances of them being interested in this content, the chances of them being engaged with this content are probably really, really high, right? You can say that with some kind of certainty. So we just want to make sure that if we're doing this, that we are improving the home experience. Like that's the whole purpose of this, um, this whole project, right? So when we zoom in um, and we actually end up talking to these users, um, we realize that you know, something interesting is happening here. So the player on the left um, does not click on the Lego content and the player on the right does click on the content. So all things being completely equal, this is like a mind blow. From the data and science side of things, we have no way to explain this kind of anomalous behavior of what is going on. When we are making this massive assumption to say, well, these users are similar, why is there this massive discrepancy between these, these two behaviors that are happening? So um, I wanna just toss this out and kind of brainstorm with you guys. What are some reasons that you think 
that one of these users, if they're completely identical, why one of them would not click on it? it yeah, if you want to come up to the mic, or I can just toss that out if you can yell it out. Uh, one of the users, it said resume game, and the other user, it said launch game. OK. So that might be a little bit too specific on some other piece of content, but this, so I'm really interested in this like specific Lego content. When they have like this massive history of playing Lego games in the past, like they both played all the Lego games, like why would they not suddenly be interested in this Lego content? Yeah. Um, the one on the left, the colors are different, which okay. makes it look more like an ad. Okay, awesome. <laughs> More ads, by the way. <laughs> okay, awesome. So yeah, so there's the sense of uh, like visually being a little bit different. So that's probably um, based on the user's like background image that they have that makes the colors, the color perception, appear a little bit differently. Um, anything else anyone can think of? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this I. Okay. So this idea of like. There's some other deal that's happening that they kind of strayed off into one side versus the other. OK, and there was another hand. Yeah. I mean, we don't have any information about the, about the users themselves. So one, okay. one is a parent and the other one is a kid. OK, awesome. That has more cartoon cartoon experience. So maybe, maybe that's why they, they might be more inclined to click. To click. OK. OK, so the, just for people on the live stream and for the recording, um, the response was that one is a child and one is an adult. So the child is probably more likely to click on it because it's more cartoonish and more appealing to a child. Um, was there one other? Yes. OK. OK. OK, so this idea that the, the visuals, again, are playing this this mind game on us that our perception is changing. Um, was there one other one? Yeah. Uh, one player might have a backlog of Lego games, but the other doesn't. Okay, so this idea that they're, maybe we're kind of misinterpreting their usage on their Lego games, and maybe they've played them, but they haven't really played them all the way through, kind of. Okay, anything else? One, one might potentially have Lego games on another platform that they prefer. They might have some on Xbox, but they may have switched to PC or something like that. Okay, awesome. I'm going to stop right there. Um, so those are great. Thank you. Um, those are all completely valid reasons. I think this idea of like something visually being off. Um, another uh, idea that we were tossing around is that the, um, the service side, there was some kind of error in the service that we, as the data science side of things, can say, oh, well, the Lego game was appearing there. But actually, if you go to the console, the actual end user experience, it's something completely different. So it's just a massive error. OK? So, just completely spilling the beans because I wanted to stop it because someone revealed my secret. Um, the, after talking to the users, so doing a couple surveys, interviews, et cetera, doing the user research side of things, um, we actually found out that the user on the left was actually sharing their account with their child. Ha ha. Um, so we kind of figured this out and it was a massive surprise and hadn't really thought of it that way. Um, but we essentially you know, found this multi-user phenomena where um, we were abstracting this idea of, well, a user is a user is a user. Um, but that was not the case. So um, going into depth on that, the um, child actually had just gotten a Nintendo Switch. And they had been the ones that were primarily playing the Lego games. And they had switched over to the Switch. And they essentially disappeared from our platform, which is why their usage and their predictability of clicking on this Lego content just completely dropped. right? Um, so this is something that, you know, going back to Devesh and the data science, I could say, well, hey, uh, I know you guys are paying attention to all this like click-through rate and all these other metrics that you guys care about, but there's this one other thing that we need to start um, looking at to make sure that we're in, uh, understanding our experience um, on the homepage as clearly as possible. This idea of this multi-user account situation that is um, possibly um, inflating or deflating what we're seeing metric-wise. I and mean, the other big point to make here is that we're also getting to this point of differentiating between console data and user data, um, which are not one-to-one -one relationships, which um, you know, going through this process, it's really great to kind of pause and acknowledge that. So you know, this is just 
one quick example of how um, we in user research were able to partner with um, Devesh and data science and kind of work through this problem, um, work through this question that we had to understand our Xbox users a little bit more. So, you know, to me, as a user researcher, this is essentially this kind of, this pinnacle approach of making sure that user research and data science are kind of working in this like lockstep formation, um, moving forward to get this kind of like ultimate knowledge of users to really understand their behavior and their intent, especially for the future. Um, so, you know, imagine, I think most of you are probably researchers here, but, you know, imagine as a, as a user researcher, you could, you know, understand how well an update or a feature or some product that you're working on how well it will do with users before you even run a usability session or before you even send out a survey because you're able to look back at all this historical data and know, well, I think the likelihood that this is gonna happen versus that is a little bit higher for this other thing. Um, so getting to this like data science approach of predictive modeling and understanding what we think is going to happen before actually talking to a user. And then obviously from the data science side of thing with you one and a half people over there, um, you know, imagine if you could talk to users and get this more complete picture of what the actual experience is like on your respective platforms or products or services or whatever it is you're working on so that you're getting a more holistic approach to the entire experience so that you're not just looking at this kind of binary, well, this is some behavioral telemetry entry that happened here and not understanding what happens at the beginning, what happens at the end of that thing. So that these users are not just a data point, they're actually a person um, that has children or that has internet problems or a lot of other things that we just kind of normally experience in the real world. So the inevitable question comes, well then, what would we have done differently? And I think there's a lot of learnings and a lot of improvement for this. Um, you know, since this was a post hoc um, kind of analysis and approach, obviously getting to this kind of a priori kind of land of understanding and predicting things before we actually um, start getting into the nitty gritty weeds of the behavioral data, that would have been fantastic to get some kind of confidence behind that. Um, you know, the other thing to mention is that, you know, getting into this idea of thinking about preventative measures um, and almost like stopping the problem before it actually is a problem for users um, is I think just this massive, massive attainable goal that um, I, I on the platform think about a lot. Like how can we kind of predict the storm before it actually is a storm? Um, and I think, you know, one way to do that is to, you know, get to a larger permutation of users, um, try to really find those outliers and try to make sure, make sure that you're understanding as many different perspectives of the experience as possible so that you're kind of wrangling in all the weird things that could possibly pop up once you actually start doing these kind of, um, these kind of studies and these analyses. Um, so does anyone know what this photo is right now? Like, I'm, I feel like I'm just completely nerding out. It's the Falcon rocket, yes. Um, so this was a successful landing on a drone ship. I think this, is, uh, this drone ship was named, of course, I still love you. Um, so, you know, I think that right now from, you know, the joint collaboration between user research and data science um, on our team, I feel like we're a little bit beyond the starting point. Like we might even be at kind of this midpoint right now. Um, I certainly will not say that everything is completely perfect, but we're getting better um, at how to really partner and understand um, how we can answer these really interesting questions with our respective strengths that we can both bring to the table. Um, so the other kind of more logistical thing that we learned is that, you know, having a more formal partnership would have been a little bit better um, and not treating Devesh as some kind of one-off on-demand service that I can just say, hey, Devesh, can you go run this thing for me? Okay, thanks, bye. Um, but maybe getting into a more formalized approach of, hey, we're gonna sit down and actually start this project together and work on it together um, and try to see it through until the end and have some kind of follow-up and some kind of accountability for both of us um, to make sure that we're getting the, the full picture of this so it's not just some kind of one-off study that we're doing. So where to go from here? Um, if I were to kind of bestow some magical advice, if this is something that you're like, oh my God, this is super cool, um, what do I actually do with this? Um, so I would say if you work on a product or a feature um, and you have a data science team or a data scientist or um, a marketing person or it, basically anyone that has access to large amounts of data about your current users or even your potential users, 
um, I would just advise to go talk to them. Grab some coffee, grab some food, and just talk to them. Um, figure out what they're interested in learning, um, what questions they're trying to answer, what they're actually doing, are there any overlaps between what you're also interested in doing? Do they have information and answers to the things that you are also asking? I'm just trying to figure out if there's some kind of overlap with the things that you are trying to do so you can start generating insights together and have a more impactful um, relationship. So, you know, this is getting to this point of, you know, not just looking at this from, you know, it's an us versus them problem, um, but trying to get to this point of, looking at the data and also making sure that you're um, including the user voice in that, uh, in that scenario. All right. That was fast. Um, here's my email address, my Twitter handle, Devesh's email address. Um, are there any questions or any just topics to talk about? Yeah. Um, it, so I think, yeah, Mike, oh yeah, sorry, form, please form a line at the microphone to ask me a question. So it sounds like a uh, great talk, really uh, interesting challenge, I think, at least in my experience and in having these two disciplines work together. Um, it sounds like you and Devesh were able to like have this really great relationship um, where I, it sounds like you both got something out of it. Mm -hmm. um, something that I've experienced is struggling as a user researcher to have uh, data scientists understand that value. And I'm, so I'm curious yeah. about um, if you've ever encountered that, what what kind of selling points or things you bring forward to help understand that symbiotic kind of relationship that could happen? Yeah, I think um, the biggest point is that we were both interested on the same topic. So I feel like if I were interested in the color black and then Devesh were interested in unicorns, like I don't know how much overlap there would be, but I mean, that's the, you know, the point of just talking to them to figure out well, what actually are you working on? Like, don't give me the five second elevator pitch, but let's go into a little bit more depth to figure out, oh, well, you're working on this thing right here. Um, I never thought of it that way because I'm also working on this other thing, but I didn't quite realize that there was some kind of like, even if it's just like a tangent, like we just touch in this one little part right here, like that could blossom into something bigger, um, especially like once you start getting the ball rolling and you realize, wow, um, we're actually learning a lot of other stuff and a bunch of other things kind of spin off from that. Um, but yeah, it, I think it has to start from some kind of common point um, because otherwise then it might feel like it's a little bit too forced and you're saying, well, we have to work together and we're like, well, I don't know on what. Um, so s having something in common, even if it's just like something super small. Yeah. Uh, first off, great talk. Thank you so much, obviously. Um, this is obvious, this is I think going to be way too simple or way too complex a question, but either way. Fantastic. Um, how do you, when you're looking at these outliers that, that spike interest, how do you assign weight to determine whether it's a useful outlier to pursue or, you know, just a, a spike that you've got to let go? Um, yeah, the, I think the short answer would be um, if we have some kind of historical information about that being an outlier in some kind of past study, so if it's something that we're like, oh, well, this is an outlier in this context, but we saw that same kind of outlier in this other context, then we might not put as much weight behind it because it's already kind of on our radar versus something that's like completely new and different that we had never come across before. Um, so I think we'd probably put more weight behind that like new and different shiny thing that we found. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. So sort of, sort of similar to one of the questions earlier, um, it's great that Devesh was sort of so willing to work with you and that you were so willing to work with him. But even when you have two excited parties, I'd imagine there's places communication can break down. Mm -hmm. So like what kinds of either artifacts or materials did you use to promote understanding when you were trying to work together and collaborate? Um, do you mean like in like with us together or like broadcasting out to our respective teams? Well, both if you could. Okay. Um, yeah, I think together... Um, I mean, it was still almost a, a slightly separate process as far as the, the things that were generated after the fact. So there was obviously a process that I have in place for how I report on information that I find out as a user researcher. And that is a very different process from what Debesh does and how he reports information that he gets as a data scientist. Um, so that's one thing. Um, as far as like broadcasting it out to the other team, um, I mean, this is just a, a way of in essentially including each other's work and our 
in our respective work. So if I am writing up a user research report, I make it a very strong case to include him and to cite him and to make sure that before I even hit publish on that report, that I'm going to him and making sure that I'm representing um, what we had worked on, what we had talked about, and making sure that I'm getting everything right from his end so that when he goes back to his team and they're like, uh, what, Lauren, what? Um, what's going on here? Um, that there's a little bit more clarity between us. So there, there's not a sense of me doing something without his input and vice versa on that, on that front. Thank you for your talk. Um, I also had a question, and this is maybe um, I didn't, or how we did it at my company wasn't as ideal as what you just presented. Um, but uh, I've been th often thinking about when you're talking to teams uh, about what are your research obje objectives. And oftentimes for me in the past, what came up, they're like, oh, we want to know how many people are doing this and that, and we're, we're doing strictly qual, and I'm like, we're going to talk to three people, so we can't tell you how many. And then we would say, you have to go to test and learn and do an A-B test and uh, find out that way. Um, and I see that you actually work with the data scientists, which we didn't do. We just read the reports or something, so I, mm -hmm. I think it's really great that you're working together. But when you're working with a team and they have a question like that, how do you address that? So how, um, how do I address So a you were talking question? about you're getting together with yeah. uh, Devesh yeah. and you just look at what you're interested in and what Devesh is interested in. Yep. But what happens when you're working with a development team and then suddenly something comes up that is not really qual, it's really um, data science or quantitative, mm -hmm. how do you address that, do you say, you should talk to Devesh, or do you get together with Devesh and um, figure it out together? Yeah, uh, yeah, this is definitely not a, um, Devesh does not sit in my office with me kind of relationship. It is, um, there's definitely a time and a place, I think, for collaboration on certain topics. Um, and I would say even, like, with certain topics, it can carry a little bit more weight as far as getting into this idea of persuasion and making sure that um, you know this kind of impact that we're creating is understood and that things kind of move into this nice drumbeat of change. Um, but it's certainly not the case where everything that I work on is something that he is also working on. Um, there are a mountain of projects that I'm doing that do not touch data science, and then there are obviously a select few projects that I'm working on that do overlap with data science. So it's definitely not a like 100% crossover between the two teams. I think it's more um, a project basis, not a team basis. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, awesome. Um, I want to make one plug. If you're like, wow, Lauren, you're super cool and smart and you want to join our team, we are hiring. Um, please come and find me. I will point you to the right person. I will give you a business card to reach out. Um, his name is Tom LaRusso. Um, but yeah, just come and find me if, uh, if you're interested or if you know someone that is possibly interested in um, a new career. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.